Yeah, I know it's episode 20, but I'm not going to do the suit and balloon bit again, because that was just a bit overkill, if you ask me. All right, we're rolling. Cue the music. Beautiful. So, did you hear? There's going to be a new Muppets television show this September. In anticipation of this momentous revisitation of retro goodness, Bill Wickstrom over there was kind enough to dig through his personal collection of Atari cartridges so we could take a look at an Atari game based on this beloved skit. It's Pigs in Space. That's now on yesterday's episode of The Today Show, airing tomorrow. First appearing in Season 2 of The Muppet Show, the fan-favorite reoccurring sketch Pigs in Space graced TV screens in 32 episodes over four seasons, telling comical stories of the space vessel known as the Swine Trek and its crew, Captain Link Hogthrob, First Mate Piggy, and Dr. Julius Strangepork. Pigs in Space was a thinly veiled parody of Star Trek, with a bit of Lost in Space thrown in for good measure. The Pigs in Space game was released in 1983 under Atari's children's series sublabel, which also included Alpha Beam with Ernie, Big Bird's Egg Catch, Cookie Monster Munch, Oscar's Trash Race, Snoopy and the Red Baron, and Sorcerer's Apprentice. And while Pigs in Space shares the shelf with some toddler-friendly character-based titles, this game offers up as much challenge in arcade action as the games geared towards older players. Pigs in Space is unique for an Atari game, as it is actually three unique games in one, represented by each character's silhouette. You could play each game as many times as you'd like, but you could only choose a new one after completing the previously chosen game. And the more you play, the more challenging it gets. Choosing Captain Link Hogthrob will start a game of Chicken Invaders, which you could probably guess is Space Invaders but with chickens. Captain Link moves left and right, shooting sausage links from his fingers one at a time to knock out the fleet. Getting hit with an egg will turn the captain into a chicken. Gonzo occasionally flies across the top, taking the place of the mystery ship in the original Space Invaders. Land a hit on him, and he scurries quickly off screen. Chicken Invaders won't win any points for originality, but as only one part of the three game package, it's forgivable. And since it's still a solid game of Space Invaders, the Muppet characters are a nice cosmetic bonus. Choosing First Mate Piggy will start up a game of Posteroids. The object here is to get Piggy to the swine trek on the top of the screen while avoiding the flying noodles and meatballs. You could karate chop the ladder if you find yourself cornered, but don't get caught up beating up wads of beef because if the ship leaves, you lose one of your tries. Posteroids is not terribly exciting, but it's also quite simple. If you're looking to rack up some points so you can impress your colleagues at the water cooler on Monday, spend some time in this game. Choosing Dr. Julius Strange Pork will start the third game, Escape from the Planet of the Gonzoids. Here you have to guide the swine trek through a treacherous pizza mine while shooting and or avoiding the deadly Gonzo robot's constant projectiles. Your ship is equipped with a boomerang cannon which curves back around to help disable those well-tucked away androids. Careful, as it's quite possible to accidentally shoot yourself. Escape is probably the best of the three, as it poses a serious challenge until you get used to the firing path of your boomerang. I've done myself in numerous times, adjusting the direction of my cannon only to accidentally knock myself into a wall. But once you do get the hang of it, it's a satisfying minigame. The three games combined offer up enough variety that you can switch things up if you start getting bored of your favorite minigames and not feel like you're just doing more of the same thing, but just in a different setting. And for a 2600 game, the graphics are actually quite detailed, with sprites looking what or whom they are supposed to be instead of some generic placeholder. And the sound effects, possessing that unmistakable VCS uniqueness, work well with this game's quirky atmosphere. And while, like other games of this generation, it may seem to grow repetitive after a while, it's still one of the better titles for the Atari 2600. Well, it seems we still have a bit of time to kill still. Bill, you brought over some games from your personal collection, didn't you? Yes, I did, Dave. Well, let us see them then. Ooh, almost in my face there. Mario Brothers by Nintendo. Silver label, missing the end label, but still playable. Mario Brothers was a watershed moment for Nintendo's Mustachio Jumpman character. This was the game that gave Mario a brother by the name of Luigi and established his profession as a plumber. And this was also the last time you see a proper Mario game on any platform not made by Nintendo, with only a few exceptions. 
Mario Bros. for the 2600 seems like a valiant effort to capture the arcade original, even supporting two players simultaneously. But then you notice that the moving coins are just glitchy square boxes until the bonus level where they're proper circles. And speaking of the bonus game, why do you have to wait for the clock to run out when you get all of the coins instead of it ending immediately? The enemies, shell creepers, sidesteppers, fireflies, etc., are all present with their various methods of flipping them intact. But they look like tiny vending machine prizes with minimal detail, and the physics to flip them sideways when you hit them running from an angle is nowhere to be found. Why do the fireballs appear so early and why are they so vigilant? Why is there no pause between when you die and respawn, leading to accidental deaths because you didn't have a moment to let go of the joystick? Which of these problems are hardware limitations, and which are the results of programmers punching out early? Complaints aside, it still plays a halfway decent game of Mario Brothers, even if it's a bit monotonous in this incarnation. But as this game was ported to practically every console and home computer at the time, including the 5200, the 7800, and obviously, the original NES, it's really hard to recommend this when there are more faithful adaptations floating around. Ah, <sighs> Coleco's Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600. It may be unfair to compare Atari's version of Donkey Kong to that of ColecoVision, but since they were both made by Coleco, it's almost unavoidable. And while it's not pretty, in some ways the 2600 version is actually more arcade authentic. Like in the arcade, you can still get killed by a barrel even with a hammer if its head doesn't make direct contact, where in the ColecoVision version, the hammer made you nigh invincible. The 2600 version of Donkey Kong has the titular ape on the left, where in the ColecoVision version has him on the right. There are 8 girders to remove on the second board, where in the ColecoVision version, it's reduced to 6. But that's where the authenticity ends. Everything else about this seems to imply a hint of Donkey Kong, but only just barely. The barrels look like Ritz crackers, and the fireballs on the girder levels merely move back and forth randomly, instead of giving any sort of chase up and down the ladders. This renders the hammer practically useless in this level, as it only takes out one fireball and leaves you waiting for it to wear off. And while the oft neglected Pie Factory level is omitted on this cart like in many other home versions, the elevator level is also MIA. I understand the 2600's limitations, but as I mentioned way back in episode 1, it's quite possible Coleco phoned a lot of this in to make their own hardware's pack-in look even better. Activision's Bridge Activision was the first third-party publisher, and Bridge is one of their earliest games. None of this changes the fact that I don't know how to play Bridge, nor do the enclosed instructions teach you anything about this card game. Bill doesn't even know how to play Bridge. Why does he even own it? Moving on. Finally! Ooh! Red Label Atari game Junior Pac-Man. Going strictly by Namco's rules, Junior Pac-Man is not officially part of the Pac-Man series. Instead, having served as another way for Bally Midway to milk the little yellow man for as many quarters as possible. Actually, Miss Pac-Man was never an authorized Pac-Man sequel either, though the game's popularity led to Namco officially adopting it as an official part of the series in later years. Another thing that Miss Pac-Man and Junior Pac-Man had in common was that their respective 2600 parts seemed like apologies for the disastrous 2600 version of the original Pac-Man, as they were much more loyal to the arcade originals. Junior Pac-Man's gimmick in the arcade was that the maze scrolled. While it moved horizontally in the arcade, here it scrolls vertically. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same Pac-Man formula. Eat all the dots while avoiding the ghosts. If you eat the power pellet, you could turn a table on the monsters. Here, however, the bonus items that bounce around the screen will fatten up some of the dots. These dots will be worth more points, but will slow down Junior more so than regular pellets. And beware, if the bonus item hits an Energizer, it will take it out. Like the 2600 version of Miss Pac-Man, Junior Pac-Man has adjustable skill levels to start the game with only one to all four ghosts and features multiple maze layouts. Playing on the normal skill level, I noticed a rather challenging game facing me on the other side of the screen. Junior seems to fly around the maze like a runaway train, and a scrolling maze means that the monsters can appear suddenly out of nowhere with little time to adjust your path. And forget about escaping via some wraparound tunnel, as there are none to be found in Junior Pac-Man. As far as the Pac-Man model goes, Junior adds very little to the table. It's no wonder this title was banished to the Island of Misfit Valley Midway unauthorized Pac-Man sequels alongside Pac-Man Plus, Baby Pac-Man, and Professor Pac-Man. But it still makes for a decent 2600 cartridge if you can't seem to find a copy of Miss Pac-Man first. Thank you, Bill, for the loners. You're very welcome, Dave. And thank you for watching. This was Dave for TV Games. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe so I can measure my self-worth numerically. And I will see you next time. I can't physically see them.
Well, it seems like we have a bit of time to kill still. Bill. <laughs> <laughs>